not going to sort of go back through um, the, the, the tactics that we had as regards the uh, sign of the players, but fundamentally, um, we didn't want to commit to 21-22 season, which is why the contracts are fairly limited, except with certain players that we knew could play in League One, and that was necessary to get them signed, etc. And it's the spine of the team, etc. Um, we will, if, if it's appropriate, sign players uh, for next season uh, in, in the next few days. If not, we won't. Uh, and again, we come back to the fact that what we want to do is to ensure that anybody we bring in actually makes the squad better than it is today. Um, <clears throat> but we, you know, we have faith in the squad that we've got, etc. Um, the next uh, issue is, is really uh, finance generally. Um, the first thing I'd say is that look, you know, we've been through quite a bit at this club over the last six years. And uh, so I'm just looking at some of the things that are coming up. Thank you for telling us we're live. <laughs> um, yeah, in, t in terms of where, where the club is generally, I mean, if you look at back at the history of this, and basically the job's done in terms of the turnaround, because we put up with some fairly hefty hits over the last six years. Relegation out of the league, three years in the non-league, back-to-back um, -back promotions, which we had to digest, uh, a, a pitch collapse in the middle of last season, demotion, um, by the EFL, losing the manager in the summer, etc. And you know, where we are at this point in time financially, because of you know, a whole host of things, including the rescue package, which we didn't allow for, um, we were basically uh, in a position whereby we shall get through the season um, w without too much of a problem these days. And you know, thank you to the season ticket holders who um, have not requested refunds, etc. And for the support that we had from season ticket holders who actually applied for season tickets when we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I think that you know that's the main message. When I, what I was saying right at the start, when we planned the forecasts for various scenarios, we, we planned that we could get through. We might not be able to do all the projects that we wanted to do, um, but with um, we'd use the, the cash that we had aside for that to help the club, you know, get through uh, the pandemic. And we were fairly confident in that. And as I say, we we installed a new pitch, etc. Um, but, you know, we're probably going to get through to the end of the season. We're probably intending, well, I am intending that we will do the projects that we wanted to do. So that's, I think, the first thing. I think we took early decisions. Um, we, we made one clutch of redundancies once our demotion was, was, was um, decided upon. And uh, I think, you know, people should look at, at, at the staff of the club and, and, and say, look, you know, they've done a great job in very difficult circumstances. Um, which is, you know, Dawn is, is, and, and the senior management team have, have been great. I mean, not having to work from home as well and so forth and so on. So I think that, you know, it's been a, a massive effort. You know, the volunteers who came in and helped during the summer, it's been a massive um, collective effort that means that we can say quite you know, comfortably, um, we, we, will, we will not just survive the season, we'll come out of the season and probably do the projects that we want to do, etc. Um, with the rec centre getting refurbed and so forth and so on. It's still a, a very uncertain picture going forward, so we can't afford to relax. But um, look, it, it, we are in a, in a position where we can be flexible, so we don't have many players tied up in contracts for next season. So whatever happens, we'll either take advantage of a market whereby um, the uh, it'll be a buyer's market rather than the, um, the wages that, that the players get. They'll be determining it with the agents. So we'll be in a better position to deal with that. But we have to keep doing what we're doing, which is to work hard at making things right. Um, the projects that we're talking about, Rec Centre, 3G Pitch, um, Disabled Passion to Lift, and something I'll just touch on briefly because it's only embryonic at this point in time. Um, one of the reasons that you know people ask questions about, you know, we're developing players and this and that and the other. That's one of the things that it's sort of, I wasn't happy with when I came here in terms of the way we're developing players in the E Triple P system. Um, it's certainly part of the focus of what what I'm now going to be looking at from, um, or I've been looking at it for some time. But um, we'll start to be moving towards how we develop players um, going forwards. In in the past, it wasn't top of the priority list because. You know, if you're in the National League, you're selling into League Two. If you're in League Two, you may be selling into League One. If you're in League One, you're selling into the Championship. But now's the time to start looking at the development of players. And that's one of the areas of potential at the club that we will be looking at. And there will be changes made over the course of the next six months. Um, one of the things that I would just like to touch on is the pitch, because uh, we've obviously had a lot of questions about the pitch. We did, as you know, um, in a, 
a bit of a gamble when we uh, when the last season was first suspended. We completely <coughs> redid all of the drains and, and relayed a, a, a brand new pitch um, that has some artificial fibre in. Um, and I'm conscious that when you're watching on iFollow, it looks quite muddy. Um, I think the first thing to say is it's largely a cosmetic issue. Um, the pitch is draining fantastically. We haven't even needed to use um, the rain covers, even when we've had games where we've had uh, an inch of rainfall immediately prior to the game. Uh, we haven't had any puddles on the pitch. It's draining brilliantly. Uh, and also the playing surface isn't cutting up. Um, that's very different from last year. Although it's thin and it doesn't look particularly green, um, the playing surface is still actually very stable and that's because of the um, artificial fibres in there. Um, the reason that the grass is thinner than we would like it to be um, is a combination of things. Uh, firstly, obviously the weather. It's been a really, really wet period. Um, the second thing is we're playing in a very compressed season. This season is six weeks shorter than usual. And obviously we've had runs in both um, FA Cup and the Papa John's. I'm trying to remember what it was called nowadays. Um, the FA Cup in terms of in terms of cup matches in the last two years, we've had more draws at home than, than, than we've ever had, I think, in the recent past. So the compressed season means simply that the grass doesn't get as long um, to recover in between games as it would in a normal season. Um, we have a structural problem at the ground in that our, our um, stands are very high, uh, particularly the cop and the main stand. And those are the sides where um, they don't get much natural light. Now, the way that you would deal with that if you were a Premier League club with money coming out of your ears um, is to buy more lighting rigs um, and to have under soil heating. Um, we currently have two lighting rigs uh, and if we wanted the grass to be thicker in these conditions with a exceptionally wet winter and a compressed season, um, we would buy more lighting rigs. The optimum would probably be to have um, about 10 lighting rigs for our pitch rather than the two that we have. Um, quite frankly, we have chosen not to go down that route um, in a covid season partly because they're expensive to run those rigs cost about 200 pounds a day in electricity to have on so uh, we're currently spending about 400 pounds a day just with the ones that we've got and obviously the acquisition cost of them is not insignificant and in the context of covid where you know we've had to let some people go um frankly we would rather prioritize uh jobs and uh matters on the you know with the squad etc over something which is essentially a cosmetic issue so um i hear the, the the concerns but i think all we can say at this point is really don't worry about it because it is a cosmetic issue it's a very um stable and decent playing surface and actually, if you look at um, a lot of the other clubs um, this season, they are really suffering uh, with the compressed season and what that does to the pitches as well. Plus the fact that people didn't get the normal pre-season to do their usual ground renovation. So you've got teams like Sunderland, like Peterborough, like Birmingham, like Bradford, all really, really um, struggling to keep their pitches playable and seeing games um, called off, which uh, we certainly haven't. Yeah, just just on that, just to put it in the context again, you know, if you're talking of 10, 10 rigs, two, 200 pound a day, it's 2,000 pounds a day, um, bear in mind that you're playing wages, uh, probably an average player, uh, the top player in the, in the current environment is on one and a half thousand pounds a week. Um, you can see what impact that would have if we pull that out and pull that out of the playing budget. So it is a question of priorities. Um, second thing I'd say is the guy who did the pitch for us is Mallinson, in my, opinion, in my opinion, one of the best in the world, because he's one of the best in England. Uh, he fixed the Wembley pitch and so forth. He does Man United, Man City. I've spoken to him about many times. And, uh, you know, he. I think you've got to put it into context. I mean, I think, and I, I don't know the full details, but, you know, Leeds have put down a carpet in the middle of the season with, with grass on it. It's one, it's one of the new carpets. But the, actually the reality is, and I, and I may be wrong on this in Leeds, but if you don't fix the drainage, you're going to have the same problems again and again. You have to lift it up. So, you know, that may cost three hundred, four hundred thousand pounds just to do that. So I think you're going to have to be getting back into your pitch in the summer and do proper renovation work on it. I think Cardiff have done the same again because everybody's suffering the problems. Uh, and OK, it's a question of what you can do. I am very confident that we have a pit. We, we, I haven't lost any sleepless nights about losing a game, uh, whereas last season we did. 
Um, I think the, the article in, in the mail, which said that uh, you know various clubs are having problems uh, and so forth, and then tagged us on the end of it. Uh, we got an apology back from the mail because we don't have any problems in that regard. It's thin on grass, and as Nicky yeah, says, they've it's just purely, picked up an old story. It's an old story. Year. They've admitted that. They've apologised, and they said, you know, they understand that what we've got are cosmetic problems as regards the pitch. So, you know, uh, thank you to all the people who've given us advice as regards what we should do on that. But I have to say, in the context, um, I think it was the right thing to do, despite the fact that it was very ballsy to, you know, to dig up the pitch on the 21st of March when they were telling us we were going to be back in playing training on the 3rd of April and playing on the 29th of April. Um, we didn't do that, but we put in place what is a good pitch and what that which, you know, you just got to be a bit patient. The grass will start to grow again. And Nicky and I are not any relations of King Canute, so um, we can't deal with the weather other than to make sure that we don't have matches cooled off because of the pitch. Um, another area that obviously a lot of people are asking about is season tickets both current se current season season tickets and for next year um taking next year's first um because it's probably the quickest that is just to say that at the moment we haven't taken a decision on how uh, we are going to deal with that we are in discussion with trosk and the trust uh, regarding how best to deal with it um, because obviously we have to go into that uh, knowing all the scenarios that could play out and what we will do. People who are paying monthly will not auto renew so you don't have to worry that you're automatically going to carry, uh, carry on having uh, money taken out of your account because that won't happen. You'll have to take a conscious decision uh, when you want to renew once we've come out with um, the new um the the new arrangements for season tickets for next season and that that will depend partly on um scenario planning and getting a bit more um of a view on the likelihood of when fans etc are going to be allowed back what we have um already committed to though is that um for season ticket holders who are season ticket holders this year um come what may there won't be any price increases next year um even if we get promoted in terms of the current season, um, if you recall, what we did was break the season into chunks because of all of the uncertainty about how, when and if fans were going to be allowed back in the stadium. So we asked people to select an option up to the end of December. Um, and basically that could be um, a full cash refund, um, a uh, vouchers um, or, or for the balance of the cost of their season ticket, less the iFollow. Uh, you could op opt out of iFollow and get a refund um, or you could uh, um, allow the club to keep the money, which uh, we're very grateful that a significant number did. Basically, for the rest of the season, those options are exactly the same. Um, if you want to change your mind from what you opted to do up to December, just email us um, and we will deal with that. Um, and, and yeah, so if there are any questions on that, um, you can email into tell us at, um, at uk or ask the SLOs, because um, I think the SLOs are a fount of knowledge uh, on most of these things and can resolve most of the questions that people have. But in a, in a nutshell, um, existing season ticket holders for the remainder of this season have the full range of options from um, opting out of iFollow and getting a game for game um, free game next year, getting a cash refund, donating uh, the balance to the club or, or getting a refund of the balance um, of the matches. Um, yeah, listen, guys, a lot of questions are flopping up on our screen because we've had to go to Nikki's phone. Um, we can't we can't tag them. So I've asked the, the comms guys to pick out some of the questions that are going yeah, through. I'll, I'll pick out some, though, that have come in um, in advance of tonight because some came in previously. So um, this one's definitely for you, Mark. What are your thoughts on how a wage cap will help other clubs going forward? Well, I, I can't obviously talk specifically about, about clubs. I think it generally helps the situation in the sense that um, you, you know, you've, got, you've got a cap on wages. And I, I've gone uh, publicly on many occasions to say that the one, the one issue that everybody seems to miss is the fact that if you just control the wages, you, you control everything. So if you, if you look at you know, the, the, the top end, you know, the people are saying, well, if we stop getting money from, for, for example, from gambling into the game, the clubs are going to go bust. Well, they're only going to go bust because they're paying the wages they're playing. 
and you know the the real issue is around those clubs who compete in a global market for players and uh, but that can be fixed by way of local um local as opposed to global squads etc so i think a wage cap is generally a good thing i think the the championship is probably not going to vote for a wage cap which i think is a bad thing uh, but i said to everybody when i talked about um where the club fits um, I, you know, certainly the wage caps they're talking about in League One and League Two enable us very, very easily to 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 sort of deal with that. Um, I think other clubs, it depends on your potential. You know, our potential, I think, is certainly at this point in time, absent structural change in the industry. In other words, change not you know, if there's a change basically in the Championship as regards wages, absent that, I think we we sit here with the potential of a very good League One club. Now, if if you change it. And you then get the gap between the Premier, the, the Championship, and the and, and the and, and League One changed. Then you know there's no reason. And actually, there's also a pathway with which we can become a Championship club. For other clubs, it's slightly more difficult. You have to look at the potential of those clubs. So if you're in a part of the country where you don't have uh, the ability to 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 build a fan base, you know, fundamentally you've either got you've got to fund that club yourself. And some of the wage caps um, will, will mean that everybody is, is much more competitive because um, that's where it's been designed. And I think you'll have a far more competitive league in League One and League Two. Um, the clubs that are affected and, and, and really are worried about a wage cap are the ones who have um, naturally more potential but happen to be in League One at this point in time. So the likes of the Sunderlands, the Peterborough, no, not St Peterborough so much, but Ipswiches, etc., Portsmouths, where they've got big fan bases currently and they can't leverage that that extra revenue because there's a cap. Now, I understand their con concerns about that, but you know, to my mind, what would I do if I was them? You, you, you take the, the cash, the extra cash that you've got because you've got a gate that's it's paying what it's paying and you'd invest it in the club you wouldn't pay it out in dividends to anybody you'd invest it back in the club so you do all the things you needed to do to improve the fan experience to improve your, your position as regards investing in players that you can develop so when you do go up you you know you've got that so it, it's really about sort of um, for me I, I can only see a wage cap being beneficial to all clubs but ultimately in the short term if you just look at the narrow window of of of, of performance on the pitch I think it'll it'll level it, and so it'll become you know um, a bit easier for the likes of. Well, I'm not going to name other clubs, but some of the might smaller have lost clubs. The connection again. Right. Have we lost I think the connection? We just need to carry on and yeah. hope that most people. I think it might be at other people's end in some cases. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody saying we must have dodgy dodgy Wi-Fi. I must admit, over the last uh, few weeks uh, since Christmas, we have had problems with the Wi-Fi here. So. Uh, Hopefully, if all the Tramway supporters ask Plusnet to get it sorted, we might get it sorted. Okay, um, okay so another question. Um, and Well, in fact, we've got two questions really around the development of players. Um, one is, with Jolly signing and Hill having a reputation for developing players, is youth stroke development and selling players part of the plan moving forwards? And what steps are you putting in place to achieve it? Well, you should have been with me this afternoon. Um, I touched on it briefly when I was talking about the squad, etc. I think that's one of the areas of the club that um, can be developed and is one of the areas of potential that, for the reasons I've said, has not been a, a major focus at this point in time. The issue is to get out of the National League, get into the Football League and then steadily build it from there to leverage off the natural advantages we have sitting where we sit in the country, close to top academies, close to um, the Merseyside region, in the Merseyside region, etc. So uh, that is certainly the focus and that in the next six months you'll see changes that will happen in that area. Um, I, I certainly want, um, call it reserves, call it a B team, uh, but I certainly want that. I, I want to, I wanna, there's a gap between the academy and the first team that I don't think is bridged uh, and that's something that I'm, that I'm intending for us to bridge. Jolly is the type of player that we may recruit from the outside. Um, somebody who's, you know, within sort of, Either it can go straight into the first team off the bench, etc., or is you know, within two years of being developed into a first team player, and there are lots of ideas around in terms of how we will do that. Um, but that'll that'll be come to fruition over the course before next season anyway. I would hope we would be able to announce something in that area. 
Okay, um, another question which is somewhat related is how much autonomy does the manager have in recruitment and retention of players in the first team squad? Well, fundamentally, it's, it's always been a decision for the manager to choose, choose his players within the budget. We, I don't think we've had, um, I don't think we've been as good at recruiting players. No, so I was asked a question outside of that. Again, finances, I'll bring you back to that. Um, Somebody said to me, are we happy that the, one of the questions was, are we happy that the overheads are under control at the club? Well, the answer is, uh, yes, I am. That's an easy answer to say. We've got them in a far better position than they were. We've got systems that look after that and we, and we look at it. Now, let's, let's put some perspective on it. We work like hell to either save 5,000 quid or to save, you know, if you're talking of, um, uh, what is it, 2,000 pounds a day, that's 15, 14, what, 14,000 pounds a week. Uh, on, on the electricity etc but I can we can sign a player for on a two year contract on what were wages at about two and a half thousand pounds a week and you, you're suddenly you now you're talking of hundreds of thousands of pounds if that player isn't the right player that go missing so you've got to look after the big things rather than just the small things and and, and to my mind that, that's one of the issues that why you know if I'm sitting on top of the club then I have to make sure that that's right so the recruitment of players, uh, we've changed what we've done on that. Uh, the manager will have the say on that. I'll have the ultimate say on the basis of, of um, you know, Steve Beck's been involved with us. who is a former agent. Uh, he's been helped. He's been one of the architects of bringing players into this club for a number of years now. Uh, he happens to be a friend of mine, but he's actually a former agent. So they understand um, what's going on in the marketplace uh, and so forth and so on. And he you know, worked quite closely with me over the course of the summer to ensure that we brought in the players that we brought in at the right price for us. Um, so in terms of the autonomy, um, we've slightly increased the involvement of myself and uh, Steve, uh, but we work certainly with Keith. So we've had a meeting today with Keith, we've gone through, but it's never a surprise because we're constantly going through our targets on a regular basis. Uh, rather than just wait until the window and then doing something. And we work on that. We work on the clubs. We talk to the clubs who's available, etc. So it is, a, it is an ongoing dialogue between the, the manager, myself, and, um, and uh, Stephen Beck. And we decide as to what we're going to do. Ultimately, at the end of the day, there is a budget. Now, I'll come back to what I'm saying. If you're looking at where we are at this point in time, the budget isn't a constraint on who we sign. Our budget is not a constraint on who we sign. So again, it's not about us you know, keeping the wallet tight. Yes, we're not going to sign Ronaldo. What, there's a wage cap in there, which we have to be under, and we are under that just. And we have a financial cap, which we've still got latitude in, which we can use to bring players in. Now, therefore, when you're looking at that, if players are brought in, and we debate it, and is it sensible? Is the player going to be an improvement on what we've got? Or is he you know, what I call a coffee club or a bench warmer? Um, we don't want any of them. We've had them in the past. We don't want any of them. And so there will be that debate and there'll be challenge on it. You know, why, how, how's that fair put in? How, how's he, how's he, how's he going to play? You know, I, I hate the phrase, it gives us something different. I mean, because I could play, I'd give you something different, but it wouldn't be very good. So, you know, I, I want to be, I want to understand technically how the player is going to fit in. And, you know, the manager says, I want this, I want that, I want this in my style of play and so forth. And, you know, so Keith has explained what he's wanted and we've we signed players, etc. like Woolery's just been signed again. So, you know, it, it is a genuine debate that's had, but it's one which isn't somebody decides that he wants somebody in and that's it. You know, we debate it and we determine as to whether or not that fits or doesn't fit with what we're trying to achieve. You know, so Dorsey will be involved in that, Parkey will be involved in that. And, you know, we'll do due diligence on a player a lot more than we used to. We, we, we certainly, you know, in, in this last year, we've brought in, we actually um, look at the social media around the player. We want the right characters in the dressing room. We only want players who want to be here in the dressing room. We only want players who have ambition. And we certainly don't want players who, you know, have a fight with the fans or, or, or abusive on social media and stuff like that. You know, they wouldn't even get over the threshold. So there's a lot of due diligence that starts to happen now in trying to bring the players in that we brought in. You know, you look at Jay Spearin, what a fantastic pro he is. You haven't got to go far and dig into his CV and to people who know him in the game as to what he is like as a person, as a player. Is he right for the, is he right for the club? Yes, he is. He is because he isn't somebody who's just picking up a wage. I, I saw a lot of them when I was playing. They get to a certain stage in their career and they'd be picking up a wage. You know, Clarkie, you look at him. 
you know, we, we were looking at him for about two years before he eventually came in. And, you know, he's still as fit as he was and he's got a great attitude as a pro. And I know what it's like when you're playing with people like that in your dressing room because, you know, they're the people who set the tone as much as the manager. And, you know, so it's very important to us and it's, you know, it's not just a one man's choice. Uh, so, um, I've had a question in around iFollow and what that means for us, um, which is quite interesting. So, iFollow on a home match day, we get about, around about 450 um, subscriptions on average. That's paying um, subscribers. Obviously, the season ticket holders um, get theirs included in their season ticket, so they're on top of that. Um, what's interesting um, is the away games because on average we're getting 1,200 subscribers for the away games and the way that it works is that um, the away team, um, i.e. the team who's at home when we're playing away, um, gets the money from the first 500 subscribers from the away team uh, and the balance goes to the away team. So on average, we are getting the money for 700 of you watching I follow um, on an away match and that makes a massive difference to us. And it is a benefit because obviously in a uh, in a normal season, we wouldn't get any revenue um, from away matches. Um, so that is something that the way I follow works, it definitely favours the clubs um, with the bigger supports. Uh, and in, in uh, League Two, we are one of the clubs with the bigger supports. So um, thank you to everybody who has um, has been tuning in to I follow. And on that, we are also aware um, that uh, a couple of people have been streaming the games illegally. Um, please don't do it. Um, if you do do it, the EFL piracy unit will get involved and it may end up in a in a prosecution because they are very hot um, on monitoring it. But also it is taking revenue away from the club. There was a, a game, I think, last week that was being live streamed and we're aware that around 100 people were watching it. Um, well, that's 100 times uh, £10 that isn't coming to the club as a consequence. So as tempting as it is, um, please don't uh, encourage anybody to try and illegally stream and, and don't access it if uh, if they do. Um, the thing about the away um, I follow, um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out once fans are allowed back. Um, I think there will be some clubs... Um, us amongst them who like the idea of um, keeping I follow for away because we have definitely got a lot of supporters who wouldn't ordinarily travel, particularly to the far flung games, who will definitely watch it um, on the television. Um, my suspicion is that once crowds are back, it will revert to the original rules, which is you don't get I follow um, for uh, the domestic market on uh, normal matches. But we shall see how that plays out. Um, we've got a question here, Mark, around COVID. Uh, many of us predicted due to the COVID situation and greatly reduced revenue that clubs would go to the wall during the last six to nine months, but this right. doesn't seem to have happened. Why do you think that is? Why clubs haven't gone to the wall? Yeah. I think uh, fundamentally the um, the rescue package has, has helped that. Um, I think that uh, we'll wait and see what happens on season tickets because lots of the lower league clubs um, do fill... The, the summer months by starting to collect money through season tickets for the following season. Um, there's still a lot of problems in, in the clubs in terms of, um, I think there's a build-up of debt. You know, they, they, they haven't paid PAYE and VAT, so that has to be paid at some stage in the future, depending on whether the government decides to let them roll it and roll it again. Um, so there are still issues coming. For us, i just tell you now, we, we've got no arrears of creditors. So um, we've, we've paid all our tax, we've paid all our VAT. Um, you know, we've also got the flexibility in the squad uh, for, for, the, for the coming window. Um, I don't know whether other clubs are in the same boat, but if they've got 10 players in contract, then you know, they, they may well have a lot of their, their future budget um, spent, I don't know. Um, but I, I think that um, the one thing about the clubs is, is that you know, they're fairly resilient in the sense that you know, they get a lot of support at times. I think the... The uh, the concerns are that if, if they didn't have the rescue package, I think a number of the clubs would have um, had significant problems. I think, interestingly, we need to look at the championship if you want to look at clubs that are going to have problems because the the fundament, the model there, and I, I'm not into it in great detail, but the model there is fundamentally flawed. Um, you're talking of bigger figures. 
Um, you're seeing certain clubs haven't paid wages in the championship. Um, and um, the, the, the money that's being advanced, as I understand it, is probably, and I haven't been on top of it in the last few weeks, but I understand it's going to be loans rather than um, grant. The stuff that came into, um, in, into this league uh, was by way of a grant. So that comes to the club. Um, just just to put some context on it, we we probably lost, uh, I think it was the thick end of, of three million quid in terms of revenues when you when you look at match days having gone, um, and uh, you know the six hundred thousand um, rescue package it was never in our plans, but it was gratefully received. Um, I think if you if you're starting to look at um, other clubs, um, you know it, it's it's for them to decide what they want to do, but. Um, I, I think that they will, you know, there, there will be a lot of sharpening of pencils. Now, if you then start to look at the season tickets for, for next season, you know, that's where the cash flow in March and April and May will start to get hit at these clubs. Um, so I don't know why that's going to affect them. I just want us to be in a position to compete against them in the market when we, when we get there, and we will be. The, 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 um, the other side to it, of course, is that fans may not have the money in the pockets um, if they've lost their jobs. And the other thing is a lot of the, 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 the owners in the lower leagues, the ones that affect us at this point in time, have businesses which are not these massive global enterprises that you know some of the owners, the billionaires who own championship clubs and Premier League clubs have. Um, and, and whilst I'm sure they're, they're sweating as well, but I think some of the smaller businesses and the owners of those businesses will also not have uh, the cash to put into clubs that they have been putting into clubs in, in the recent past. Um, I do know of... Um, a lot of owners who look to want to sell and to get out at this point in time, um, and you know I think that that will be the you know, the next two years. That's what you will see. Um, okay, a couple of other things. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention um, because otherwise I'll forget because I'm conscious that time is getting short, um, and it's something that we would like your feedback on. Um, what the club would like to do at some point um, is a memorial game uh, to recognise the supporters of the club and family members of the supporters of the club who've died um, over the last year. Now, obviously, this, uh, I think, probably was given heightened attention because of COVID, um, but also because in a normal season, we would regularly place um, articles and photographs of supporters who've, uh, who've uh, passed on uh, just in recognition of them. And because um, we're playing behind closed doors, it's just not the same. Uh, so the suggestion was made that we have... Um, a memorial match where we can do a big program that puts something in about all of the people who've passed on not not those just from covid um some you know who who have, have passed on just for um other natural causes etc um assuming that people think that is a nice idea to do we would like it to actually become something that we do annually um but the question is around the timing um i think there are some people who think we should do it in February so that it doesn't get uh, sort of lost in end of season, um, you know, matches, particularly if we do end up uh, in playoffs or celebrating promotion or something. It might, it might be a difficult juxtaposition, um, but equally... Uh, there are others who feel we shouldn't leave it too long. So um, if people have thoughts on the principle of the idea and also the timing, uh, if we would do it, then please let us know and we will take those into account. I've got some... Um, I've got... Uh, <coughs> I've, 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 just got to, I've just been talking to the comms guys and say, listen, if you, if you want to continue us on past seven, uh, we will do on the basis that I think it's been fairly patchy in terms of the internet. So... If you want to do that, just send some message into that you want us to continue on. Uh, I picked up some questions from here. There's one here that says, what are your plans for the next three to five years? <laughs> um, I think we sort of touched on that at, at various times. Uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's be blunt about this. The job that we came to do is done. The turnaround has, has been done. The club is fixed. Um, the club has been able to get through COVID and uh, take that in its stride, relegations, as I say, and so forth and so on. So, um, you know, in terms of what financial I want to do, financial stability, um, 
people it's attractive again as a club for people in a whole host of ways you know players actually see that managers see that invest, investors see that so um, the job is done um, the uh, the clock is chiming time's out we're finished um, so it, it, it's, it's quite interesting as a question because whilst we've got it into a position whereby you know if we'd have hit COVID six years ago where the club was, it would have gone down without a doubt. Uh, and I put 35 years of looking at failed businesses uh, behind that statement. So unless Peter was prepared to fund it, which we never know. So um, it, it is done, but there is still potential left in the club to, to move on. And um, I, I said it in, in, I think it was two AGMs ago, um, that you know that you, there is a track and a pathway to becoming a championship club. And if you're a championship club, you're six games away from the premiership. So I think that's what um, we will continue to do until the point comes when it's not appropriate. I mean, I'm 70 next year, which uh, I don't feel it, but I mean, you say I look it, but you know, it, it's it's something that you know, we, we just need to take into account. Um, th there's still lots to be done. And, you know, there's lots of people who have contributed to getting the club to where it is. So. Um, you know, you've got to be cognizant of what they've contributed, you know, whether it's the, uh, the, the trust, the fans, uh, the support that we've had over the last, you know, few years, including over the last, you know, um, 12 months, which has been immense. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a responsibility to make sure that, you know, uh, we, we sort this club to the best that we can. And I said, it's like being on a track whereby you pick up the baton in a relay race and you want to hand it on further down the track. We're further down the track uh, and that will be the case. Um, that if we get to a position whereby we believe there's anybody else that will take the club further and better than us, then that's fine. It, it, it doesn't change anything from a day-to-day -day basis because we continue to do the things that we continue to do. You know, in front of me every day, I look at the projects that we want to get finished. Um, this month has been making sure that the, the squad, we adjust uh, in terms of the squad so we get through the second half of the season, you know, in, in the best way that we can, in, in great shape and a great opportunity in front of us for that. Uh, and then if we're in League 2 next year, then, you know, we, we're, we're in a great shape to look at the window. If we're in League 1, we're in great shape to look at the window. Uh, and, and we continue to, as I say, look in now, moving on again into looking at the development of the club, which is an area of potential that we've not realised. So... In three to five years, do, where do I think we'll be? We'll definitely be a strong League One club. Um, would we be in the Championship? I don't know. Um, you know th th there's a platform here if somebody wants to come in and, and invest in that to make it happen more quickly than it would otherwise happen. Um, new stadium, that's certainly on the agenda to be discussed and debated. We haven't got the finance to do that, but there are many ways to, you know, to finance something. We can sort that out if we need to. Um, so, you know, what I'm looking at as a club, it, it's it's a very. I've had a conversation this afternoon with people, and uh, you know, it, it's a, it's it's a good club to look at uh, because it's not it's gone through COVID and it's come out stronger probably than where it was at the start of COVID. So, um, three to five years, there's there's a project here for whoever wants to take it forwards, or you know, we'll take it forwards if there's nobody wants to take it forwards, um, or if the fans have had enough of us and we can disappear. Um, <laughs> I'm going to take a controversial one now because uh, there is somebody who has written in uh, to say that um, he objects to the players taking a knee um, before the matches and he won't be returning to games whilst they do it. Um, and he is uh, clear to point out that it's not because he is... Uh, a racist has anything at all against uh, black people. It is because of the politicisation around Black Lives Matter thing. Um, I think it's really unfortunate that it, it, it a sort of political movement has spun off the back of that because um, we are wholeheartedly in support of an anti-racist message. We are absolutely not in support of some of the political messages that have um, used that as a platform. And I think the, uh, the Premier League and the EFL have made it very, very clear that they absolutely do not align themselves with the political elements of that um, strapline at all. It is only the anti-racist message. Um, somebody said to me, and it, it and it really resonated, that that whole area would have been a whole lot less controversial if the hashtag had been Black Lives Matter too. 
Um, because I think if you read it that way, then I, I think there are very few people who would object to it. And frankly, if you did, then um, you're probably not somebody that, that we would want um, at, at the matches. Um, but the fact of the matter is we don't tell the players what to do. It's entirely a matter of conscience for them. We leave it entirely up to them. They have taken the knee um, at some games. They haven't taken the knee at all of them. I don't know how they decide. I presume they have a discussion with um, the opposing team um, and perhaps the referee about it at the time. But I don't think it's something that we should dictate to players. It is a very personal and individual decision on whether they think it is appropriate or not. I totally agree. As a, as, a, as a former player, I'd say the same thing. And in fact, that was my first response to it. It was that, you know, it, it's an individual decision for players. You know, and the dressing room will decide amongst themselves what they're going to do. Um, and, you know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, We've but, had a, a question asking whether we can put to bed the myth that we only have one part-time um, grounds maintenance man. Yes, I can absolutely put that to bed. We have three full-time grounds people, sometimes four, um, not at the moment because we can't take more apprentices on um, just because we can't, in a COVID scenario, um, supervise them as they would need to be. Um, but that team of three or four full-time groundsmen is supplemented by um, other members from the maintenance team who help up with some of the more uh, mechanical stuff like pitch mowing. I've got a question here. Are we still getting revenue from China? The answer is yes. Uh, we've just signed a new contract. Um, it, all of the international business last year went on hold because of uh, COVID for obvious reasons, um, especially the China one. Um, but, you know, we, we've got... Uh, we will open up again um, in China. We are actually... Um, well, we have teachers who are, who are teaching in China, which is how it originally started. Uh, and, you know, we know that uh, in Inner Mongolia, the, 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 pull, the guys are pulling together a five-year plan, which they want us to be an integral part of. Um, we, uh, obviously, with Indonesia, with our, our investors from Indonesia, we're, we're heavily linked into there, ready for that market to kick off. And we've also got the state side, whereby we invested for a year in that, in terms of guys coming out and building relationships. And we've now got a, a, a an internet-based um, product, which uh, we are about to look at signing up with 10 of their clubs. Their clubs have about 2,000 kids in, 10,000 kids in, um, um, for uh, having a partnership agreement with them. So so once the, the travel restrictions drop away, we, you know, we're fairly positive that, you know, that the international business will fulfill um, the aspirations for it. Um, so um, there's a, just looking at some of the questions coming on on the screen. One is about um, will we still have a top third budget um, in coming seasons despite COVID? I, I, th I think you've probably already answered that. Which yeah, is... yeah, can I just take that point? Because you know, I said the aspiration, nobody's ever defined what a self-sustainable club is. And I said right at the start, the aspiration, the aspiration, what you're trying to get to is a top third budget in whatever league you play in and break even. That was the aspiration. I never said we were actually at a top third budget other than in the National League, where we were. Now, what, what I was also... There's three ways in which you get a top third budget. One is the, the, the club organically creates that amount of revenue which enables you to have a top third budget. Two is you get a sugar daddy who sticks his hand in his pocket and gives you a top third budget. And three is you bring actually that budget down to meet you which is what I've been trying to do in my public utterances around get a wage cap in. We've now got a wage cap in that you know, means that we could, we'll certainly, in the future going forward, have a top budget. So, you know, and, and just as we sit here today, um, you know, we, we, can, we, can, we, can, we have a, a budget in excess of the wage cap for the division because we're allowed that in the transitional period. So um, I think that issue is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, League Two and League One, um, we will always be able to be maintaining a competitive presence in that. Now, if if, if you say that um, uh, you can, imp that's why I'm looking at imp improving the football processes, because if if you say that we are have got better recruitment, development, management, and player trading, then actually what you're doing there is you're making sure that with the budget that you've got, you're making the best spend you can get out of that budget, and that's part of the reason why. 
the next step that we look at is improving the, what I call the football processes, which is recruitment. Recruitment we've already started to work on. We want to formalise that process so we do it year in and year out. And eventually, at the end of the day, we'll get to developing players, so you'll sell the players some money, etc., and so forth and so on. I've got a question here. Um, are we going to strengthen the link with bigger local teams? That's part and parcel of the development um, aspect of the club because once you start to I've said this before in the National League the player doesn't want to come from a Premier League academy to play in the National League particularly his family doesn't want it his friends don't want it his agent doesn't want it his club doesn't think it's appropriate to play a different style of football you know that, that we've seen it many times clubs want their players to get games every week and they want them to play in the championship yet they go to a championship club and they sit on the bench you know, they then say, well, maybe it's League One, or maybe it's League Two. So there is an element of it's easier when we're in League One, and it's easier that we're in the Football League than the National League. But the key thing is you have to, A, play a style of football that suits the style of football they've been brought up with, and B, you have to convince the, the, the club that this kid is going to come and he's going he's gonna to develop while he's with us. And, you know, these people who say, well, the kid has to come and has to play, it isn't going to happen because I'm not going to basically sacrifice um i will not be sacrificing this club you know or becoming a you know a, a development tool for liverpool at the expense of this club the kid has to come and part of the learning process as every player who's played professional football knows and that most people understand anyway that you've got to earn your place in the side and that's part of your development so it's entirely unhealthy for clubs to insist the players have to come and play so, uh, so that's all part and parcel of the relationship with the bigger clubs. But we have to prove ourselves first as a place where that can happen and it is a genuine development of the player.